Welcome everyone to our to our meeting. Uh, yeah, it is definitely sunny and hot in North Carolina. It is also very sunny and hot in. Um, okay, I'll do that. Um, okay, I'll I'll ignore the the email you sent. Um, very hot in Atlanta, most definitely. It's nice in this convention center, though. It's really not bad at all, quite honestly. Um, surprisingly, a lot of times we end up in very hot places. But how's the pizza? It was horrific. Horrific. That was probably the worst pizza I've ever had in my life, I have to admit. Um, it was called Papa John's, but it was kind of like, I have a bad. It was really bad. I hate to admit it, but I will say the food they fed us today from catering was very good. So I was impressed with that, which is not something we normally get. Can I ask a question? Dude. I'm going to be honest. I got some practice test questions from the dean where at the technical college where I, I adjunct at. Yep. And I can't answer any of those questions. I'm looking at them, I'm studying them, but I'm thinking I'm on chapter nine and I would have failed it. Well, let me ask you this. What are those questions designed for? Which class? It says um, it's Cisco 200-301. Is it the very first course? I believe so. Post one of them. Implementing and administering Cisco solutions, Cisco CCNA. Well, now there's the thing. Is it is it all? three semesters or is it just one because this is just the first. This is only one of three. Good question. I don't know. I assumed it was just the first first one. There's 200 practice test questions. Uh, send, put, drop one in the chat. I guarantee it's for the whole CCNA, not this first class. There's two more whole classes to go before you can sit for your CCNA. Oh, so after this class, we can't take the, the test? No, no, you've got two more classes uh, to go after this one. And they're all 16 chapters. Uh, I think, yes. The last one may be 15. But yeah, they're not all the exact same. But And you can't take the test unless you pa pass those other two classes. Well, you can take it, but the chances of failing are, are real high. Okay. Well, I'm going to be honest with you. You're probably not going to pass it. Right. Okay. I don't want to raise three hundred dollars. No. That's my next question. How, mm -hmm. So after this class, uh, is there? Are you all going to give the next class? Or yeah. we teach the we teach the CCNAs every single semester, and I am in the process of trying my best to get enough funding to have at least fifty free slots for CCNA two. Um, if we don't have 50 free slots, the class costs 200 or $195 or 50 cents uh, per slot. So um, I think we are going to have enough to do at least 50 slots. And I'm posting in the uh, chat our schedule, our class schedule, and that gives us our class schedule. Our next set of classes begins September 8th and runs to December 8th. Okay. Okay, uh, M. Romney, what's your question? Is the next classes as involved as these? Yes. Or as you get acclimated, does it become oh, easier? I think it's easier because you don't have to learn all the systems. I mean, this first class, you've got to learn how to use the Netacad. You had to learn Packet Tracer. You have to learn NetLabs. Get all that stuff down. So you can, uh, it makes it a lot easier in the rest of the class. Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, the thing is that I turned in the assignments. Uh, you can hear me? Yes, uh, I can. I may have to make some changes here and figure out how I can get a USB connector in here. But let me see. Go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. Go okay. ahead. Okay. Yes. Uh, the thing is that I turned in assignments, but uh, when I do the result check, result checks on the packet tracer, yep. my host, it is not finding the host name. I I set up the host name. I configure the host name in the packet tracer. Yep. But host name is not finding. Okay. And in the result check, it's not giving me hundred percent. Yeah. You have to. The one thing I will say is the host name has to be the exact same capitalization 
It has to be the exact same name, and um, even no space is allowed because if you do it, will it will count it will count off. Okay, I am doing the lowercase. So is that the reason? Yes. It is case sensitive, so if you don't put it in the same case, it will not score correctly. Okay, and uh, I think we will find it the next uh, the password. For example, uh, enable secure password. If I give a different password. Yeah, will they accept it instead Correct. of? It will not give you, yeah. Yes, you've got to have exactly right, or it will not give you the uh, the the um, the full full um, credit. Now, David, okay, okay. You so, run in on two nine one. It is possible there there could be a, a packet tracer to where, um, especially the ones that auto generate a set of one of three. Sometimes they give us a little bit of trouble. Um, but if you know you put it in right, just when you upload it, say, hey, I, I, I did it right and it was it didn't grade because it correctly. If I make a, make a mistake and uh, give a wrong password, I want to change the password. I don't want to start from the beginning. So that is why I am stuck that, you know, my class instead of it became class. Yeah, and you just, you just changed the password. If you're in Packet Tracer, you change the password. We had several people in today's competition mistype their passwords and ended up losing all the points because they did not yeah. have the right so, so I need to learn how to change the password, you know? Yes, uh, all you have to do to change yeah. the password is put in the one you want it to be. So like before, when we were looking at passwords on devices, okay, so here I am in a switch. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen, I guess, and I'm not actually showing my screen. Uh, give me one second and I will share my screen. Okay, so is everybody seeing a switch right now? Yes. So let's say uh, I, yes. go, I go in and I configure my switch. <laughs> okay, host name, S1. Yeah, uh, please mute yourself. Oh, well, actually, talking in your office. This is the beginning stage. I just took it apart, shot it, oh. disconnect the battery, plug it back in, see if I can get it to turn it on. But uh, who is that? It's probably that's probably that's where it's, where it's headed. <laughs> That was okay. I moved, muted for shot. All right. Okay. Um, so I've given this host name S1. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. You can hear me. All right. So now let's say I'm going to set my enable secret password. So I type enable secret and I put in class. Okay. But then I decide, no, I don't want to use class as my enable secret password. The correct way to get rid of that is there, you can just type enable secret Cisco and it will overwrite your previous password. Same thing with your configurations, with the line configurations. If you go to line con zero, I'll put in my login synchronous because I always do that. That keeps it from uh, having data show up on the, on the screen when I'm trying to, to work. Um, but if I put in password, let's say I mistype it, let's say I type password, okay? The way to fix that is just put in the correct password. Now, if you want no password at all, put no password, Cisco. And that would get rid of the entire password. But if you just change it, it will still do show run here. Let's do a pipe. Begin line console zero. It's got to be capitalized. Thank you. Okay, what does the no password Cisco does? No passwords would remove all passwords. It would take oh, okay. them away. So right now, let's say I, instead of changing the password, I just took the password. So there's line con zero. So let's do this. I'm going to set, I'm in it. So I'm going to set a password of Cisco. Now let's do a do show um, run. Pipe, by the way, this is just like um, using any type of Linux commands. You'll see we're going to start there. Now you see my, my password is Cisco. If I wanted to change that, I just put in a different password, class. And now you'll see the password changes to class. But if I'm going to remove the password completely, by the way, you can just hit control A to go back to the beginning of any line, control E to go to the end. I type no. And if I show the now, 
There's no password whatsoever on the line. Yes, if you lock yourself out, NetLabs does have a password recovery. So you can click here and do password recovery. Okay. You also can erase the configuration or you can reset the entire lab and it will set it back to a default. One of the things I'll tell you is be very careful when you're putting in passwords that you don't do something like this password and then put in, you know, Cisco space because space is a character to the password mechanism. So you now your password is not Cisco. Your password is actually Cisco space. And like I said, we get students doing that all the time. In fact, when they lock themselves out, most of the time, the way I, the first thing I do is I try it with an uppercase. Then I try it with a lowercase. Then I try it with a space afterwards and a space in front of the, the correct password. So that's, does that make sense? Yes, uh, I made a mistake was like, I, I created the class in a whole password yep. instead of secret, pass, secret uh, uh, password. So when I enabled the secret password with the enable one, it said that you used the class as an enable password, which you right. cannot use as right. a user. So right. in that regard, I should completely erase for the password, then I can restart the password setting. That's exactly, so what you did was this. Let's, I'm, I'll show you exactly what you did right here in our example. So you did enable uh, password yeah. and you did class. class. And yeah. then you tried to do enable secret class and it barked at you and said, sorry, you can't do that. Yeah. So what you should have done is just done and uh, no, control A, no enable password class and then set your enable secret password. We really should only be using enable secret. And then remember, whatever comes after that is just the password. So you just put in whatever your password is, okay? And most time we just put in class for our class because that's what we use. 99% of all Cisco commands that when you wanna get rid of them, just put a no in front of it. Uh, okay. Um, we'll, We'll check that out, David. So I was able to access switches through the piece. Okay, yeah, you're supposed to, you have to connect. That is, we've showed that in the, uh, I, I think we pretty sure we showed it in several lectures ago. 291, you have to connect the consoles to the switches. That's the only way to get into them. So that was, uh, we, we've shown that in two different uh, examples that we showed with Packet Tracer in the class recordings. Okay. Again, here's our class schedule for the fall. Um, I'm trying to get free classes for all of you. I uh, can't guarantee it, but we're going to do our best. Um, the slots will be available first to those who pass this class and do well. Um, and so, you know, um, just be aware that we're trying our best um, to get some funding to pay for those. Any questions? So which ones of those do you have to pass? Can you show that again now? Yep. Which ones do you have to pass before you can take the exam? These, CCNA one, two, and three? Yep, CCNA one, two, and three. Futures. Yes, yeah, CCNA one, two, and three. Do you have good pass rates for people that take all three? Uh, honestly, if they ever told me, I would, I would, I would know, but I don't even know the pass rates. Um, you are not required to take the exam in order to teach in the academy. So when you finish this class, you can teach. Um, when you finish all three, you can teach all three in the academy and you're not required by the academy to pass your exam. I firmly believe in passing your exam. Um, if you're gonna teach it and ask your students to pass it, then I feel like you need to pass it. Um, so that, take that as it is, um, but we don't have any exact pass rates. So you have to be a Cisco Academy before Correct. you can teach Cisco. And that's that's kind of an arduous thing to get passed through your school. Is that correct? It takes about 10 minutes if you want to sign up for it. I mean, it's, it's literally, you know, you go to netacad.com and I'm already logged in, but you scroll. Um, you want to become an academy and it's literally, let's see here. I've got to remember exactly what I think it's just at the bottom. I don't know why we're getting... Uh, Teach with us. Here it is, educators. Click right here. Scroll to the bottom. 
Would you like to become a, an academy? You just come here and apply. Does it cost your school anything to become an academy? We charge, as an academy support center, we charge you $600 a year if you're a community college or university to be a Cisco Academy. And that's it. So, and that gives you access to the CCNA, Linux, IT Essentials, CyberOps, CyberOps Associate, um, all the curriculum that's available, basically. If you look in here, I don't know why we're still got some. Yeah, try to shut it off because we got it's still coming through. From, it wasn't doing it before. Here's all the materials that are available in Cisco Academy. So CCMA one, two, and three, CCMP, advanced routing, DevNet Associate. All of these are things that are available to you if you become an academy for that. And that's Cisco charges nothing. We have to charge something to be an academy sports center. That's how we had enough money to pay for y'all to take these classes for free. John, yes, uh, th this class, I got to check on this one for CCMP credits, but I know our DevNet and our CyberOps associate and our CCMP classes actually provide CE credits for you. I don't know if this, I don't think the CCNA does, but I know the other ones do. So yes. Um, some of these do provide CE credits. And what John is asking about is there's two ways to recertify your, your Cisco certifications. You can either um, retake the exam or take a higher level exam, or you can get what's called continuing education credits. And we do provide continuing education, continuing education credits through our classes for Cisco certification renewal. So yeah, good question. I don't think the CCNA ones do, however, John. I think it's only DevNet, CyberOps Associate, and CCMP that are, are doing that right now. So, unfortunately. So, Karen, depending on your school, I've had schools literally become an academy in three days. Um, it just, you got to read the steps here, make a decision, and there you go. We. The, I mean, it's it's politics at our school, though, to try and implement new courses. Yep. Uh, you know, everybody's protecting their turf. But I, th I see that this would bring in students to the school if you were a Cisco Academy and ha having Cisco courses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and quite honestly, you're giving the students the skills they need to get a job. So um, that's you know, it, it's a great way to teach. And you can teach it both in continuing education and in curriculum. So. It's something to be taught on both sides. Okay, any other questions? Let me show you our schedule again. This is our fall schedule right now. Um, we may have an, EA, an ENA RSI CCMP class depending upon uh, me passing that and also uh, on whether or not there's anyone interested in it. Um, I tried to offer it uh, this summer and only had five people sign up for it. So I was not able to teach it this summer. Sorry, I'm eating some, some cookies and I'm hungry. <laughs> Kelly, you're in Atlanta right now. That's where Karen and I, we're like right out outside of Atlanta. Uh -huh. Are people coming in and looking at what you're doing? Are they asking yeah. or is there interest? We're are interested in doing that at our school, yeah. the um, Skills USA. Sure, sure. Yeah, unfortunately. This is the first year they have not allowed open public access to the floor. And I don't know why. I have no idea. If, I don't know if we could get them in tomorrow. I don't think we'd be able to get them through the, if they want to come and watch what we're doing. If y'all want to come down tomorrow. We, we can walk there with them. How early? We're here from eight to five o'clock tomorrow at the Georgia Royal Congress Center. So I'll, uh, I'll direct message, Karen, I'll direct message uh, you my, um, uh, here in the chat, I'll send it directly. I'll send you my cell phone number and then you can text me. And, and if y'all want to come down, we'll, uh, we'll make it happen. Just like I said, you just need to let us know and we'll send somebody up to. Because we're, we're, Lorraine and I are char in charge of the cyber competition teams. Yep, there's a cyber ops. There's actually a cybersecurity competition two two down from us. Yeah, well, 
So I just sent you my social yeah, yeah. number. Uh, so uh, feel free to text me. My phone's off right now, but text me and we'll, if you do come tomorrow, we'll uh, we'll get somebody up there to let you in. We're in building C, but you got to go to building A to get registered. We'll basically say okay. you're a judge and, and those are being reported. So, All right. but we'll make that happen. Okay. Any other questions? I know we're, we're running late today, but we were late to get started. So we'll do a little bit here. All right. Let's look at this. What's the MAC address? By the way, we were complaining today about people not knowing what MAC addresses are. Y'all better know it because I've told you. What is MAC address? Cool address. It's, a, it's a unique device address. Okay, very good. Unique. And let's do this. Let's call it a unique device physical address. Okay. Because it is burned into the NIC. How many bits is it? 48. 48 bits. And we know 24 bits are the we. That's the first 24 bits. Last 24 bits are the serial number. Now, all that's fine and dandy, but why is this important? It's important because MAC addresses are used as the layer two addressing on Ethernet for any two devices talking to one another. So when you have, I'll start my whiteboard up here. I know you're going to get some of my lovely handwriting today. Okay. So when two devices are talking to each other, they're going to be using Mac. And you look at an ethernet frame, you'll notice that on an ethernet frame, there's a start of frame preamble. Okay, so the start of frame delimiter. And then there's a six byte or 48 bit, six times eight, 48, destination Mac address, and then a source Mac address. So when you have a network, and on that network, you have a switch. I'm just gonna do a switch to start out with just to make life a little easier here for the show things. Okay. And we have two PCs connected. We have little PCA here. Ooh, he's happy, he's had a long day, but he's happy. Got a little PCB here, not PCB like the stuff you take, but PCB, he's happy too. These two <laughs> wanna talk to each other. A, let's imagine that A knows B's IP address. So we know 192, so however A got the IP address. Now we know normally, how do we find IP addresses? Normally we use- DNS. Configure them, we set them ourselves. Yep, we, we set them, or if we're looking for a host that has actually fully qualified domain name, we may look in DNS. But let's assume we- Go check your DHCP tables. You can take, yeah, you can check those too. But even the DHCP tables use MAC addresses, right? Because they right. the address to a MAC. But if A wants to talk to B, so let's say we just ping from A to B. Now ping is the layer three. A can't ping B without knowing its MAC address. So there's a special protocol called ARP, which is the address resolution protocol. And I'm sorry, but this is up at the top of my screen here. Address, res, man, that's terrible. Resolution, wow. <laughs> sorry, best I got today. I'm crippled and I have bad hands and it's on top of the screen. But what'll happen <laughs> is A will send out an ARP request and it will broadcast that ARP request. It will go out and basically the ARP request is saying, who has the IP address of 192.168.10.11? That device will then respond with an ARP re uh, reply that says, oh, that's my IP address and my MAC address is BMAC. And I know that's not an actual MAC address, but it's whatever MAC address is. Yeah, BMAC, okay. And then A will store that in its local table. So all machines have a MAC address table. So if I go in here and I do CMD and I type ARP-A, you'll see my MAC address table for my different interfaces. 
my physical interfaces and my uh, my WAN, uh, wireless and my physical interfaces. But you'll see, here's the IP addresses and here's the physical address associated with that. So I have learned that dynamically through ARP. Everything that I communicate, I have to have the MAC address for if I'm communicating on ethernet. Now this, here's something very important I just mentioned to you. Say a question, sir. Uh, well. Alex, I'll get back to that. Yes, we're offering all those courses simultaneously in the fall. Um, but now, I told you it was a broadcast, right? An art request is a broadcast. What happens, that's supposed to be a switch, y'all, sorry, pretty ugly. What happens if, this is 10, 10, 10, 10. What happens if A wants to talk to C? It knows the IP address because we either told it to ping 10, 10, 10, 10, or it may try to ping www.hackme.com, whatever. But then the ARP request says, who has 10, 10, 10, 10? And that gets broadcast out to every interface except for when it came in on. Routers do not pass broadcasts. That's a rule by default. Routers will not pass so we have to have a mechanism for that ARP reply to be returned in some way so that A will have a MAC address for 10, 10, 10, 10. And what happens is the router uses a process called proxy ARP. Okay. So if it's a remote host, the router responds with its MAC address as the MAC address for that remote host. And it's called proxy art. If it's a local host, the local host will respond. So there's not request, there's not reply. If it's a remote host, you do a ARP request and the router proxies its MAC address for that remote host. And it knows it's remote because you say a ping to 10, 10, 10, 10, and then your ARP request would be who has 10, 10, 10, 10, the router would look in his route table and say, ooh, that's a remote host, and would respond with proxy art. So as we look in here and we look at uh, the MAC address and MAC address tables, okay? Look down here just real quick. I don't think they have an example of what I just showed you that I'm, I can see right here easily. No, they don't have an easy one. I'm show you there. Make sure there's no yep. same thing there as frame fields. Oh, well, here it is. Yeah, here's the example. So if you're trying to get MAC addresses for remote hosts, you'll notice here that the host, when it sends a ping, it will get a the NIC, the destination NIC won't be this remote host over here. It's not going to be this final destination. It's actually the router's NIC that responds. So what would have happened here? Let me do a let me do a snipping tool. Okay. Oops. Got too many things on this one little B screen. Okay. So let's snip. Are you Karen Benson? No, not yet. I am getting ready to try to drop a snip here. Hold on just a second. There we go. Y'all see my snip? It's got my picture in it, unfortunately, but there we go. So in this case, this final destination over here was 172, 12 something. When PC1 wanted to go to this web server, one of the first things it would have needed to have done, is it would have sent out an ARP request. That request would have come into the router. The router would have said that's a remote IP address and would have responded with its MAC address for the layer two address. That is called proxy art. 
That is something we see over and over and over on the CCNA and on other tests. So I would know that, right? So why did it show Karen's name in your picture? I have no idea. No idea. It's cause I, I just, I just did a snipping tool. That's what I did there. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about MAC addresses. Unicast MAC addresses again are 48 bits. First 24 bits have the EUI. The last 24 bits are the um, serial number. So OUI and vendor assigned serial number. And what happens is this. We have, I need to send information to H3. It looks in the local ARP table for that particular device. If, by the way, if it did not have this destination MAC address to make the frame with, it would have sent out an ARP request. If it has it, it's able to immediately make the frame. That's why I showed you my ARP table. You will see if I ping right now, let's say I'm gonna ping, let's see if it'll work. It may not work because of where I'm at. 10 dots, let me do an IP config. So what my IP address is on my LAN adapter. So I'm 64115, okay? So it's doing ARP dash A. So I'm gonna ping 64.1.193. So let's ping 10.64.1.101. I do 101. Okay. Probably won't let me because on this network they're probably blocking ping. Yeah, it's all right. Um, are you connected to the wireless here? I am. Yeah, but I'm saying if you're connected to wireless here, tell me what your IP address is. Brian's sitting here beside me. I'm gonna try to ping his uh, his machine on the on this the actual Georgia World Congress Center wireless. But what happens is when I send this ping out to ten six four one one zero one, if that MAC address was not in my ARP table. It would have gone out and did an ARP request and then hopefully got back an ARP reply. Yep, what is it? 10.64.1.30. 10.64.1.30. All right, so that's Brian's uh, PC. And if I do an ARP dash A, you'll see now I have a new, I have a new entry in my ARP cache right here. 083571ED930A. And I could do an OUI lookup to see what this is right here. And then I could see what I'm pinging. All right. Now, a lot of these are look exactly the same. So these are probably a lot of uh, machines using the same type of wireless um, NIC. But that is the process. But when I pinged him, my machine sent out an ARP request to that particular IP address and got an ARP reply from his, and it went in there. Now, the neat thing is that all happened in the background without me having to do anything, okay? You know, it's, I love this. This is so good here where it's doing an ARP request. This is not addressed to me. I shall ignore it. I don't know why they suddenly went into Old English, but they did. Yeah, I was carrying Zoom time on the mind. But we see here, unicast MAC addresses are MAC addresses that are for one single host, just like any other unicast address is. The broadcast MAC address is all Fs. So for instance, an ARP request has a, a destination MAC address of all Fs so that everyone can see it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to respond because it wouldn't be able to go to everyone in the entire network. And then multicast are specialized MAC addresses that are associated with multicast IP addresses. They're actually derived from the multicast. And one of the things to remember is a unicast is one-to-one, -one, a broadcast is one-to-all, and a multicast is one-to-some, so, or to a group. So now, if we wanted to look at MAC addresses, we can do that. This is a, a lab to show you how to do that. I've actually got a lab set up in the in the classroom or in the net labs here that I want to show you some stuff. I'm gonna move this tile up to the side here. So the first thing I want to do is I want to open up 
And I'm going to put an IP address on this machine. Okay, so let's change the adapter settings here. And I'm going to give this an IP address of 192.168.12.10. That's my favorite IP address range, it's 12 range. Everybody's got a favorite IP address range, right? You should say yes, that should be yes. Yes. You're not geeky enough, you don't have your own favorite IP address range. Okay, so I'm gonna go in here now and this is on PCB, I'm gonna put 192.168.10.11. So what I wanna show you here is, I'm gonna show you populating the MAC address table on a device. Okay. Now, I'm going to do this while I'm sitting here. I'm going to start Wireshark. I'm going to start capturing over here on PCB. Make sure I get the right interface. Okay, so we want that one, and we're going to start capture. So we are capturing. So I'm going to go over here to PCA now. And the first thing I want to do is I want to show you my ARP cache, so ARP-A. You'll notice there's some stuff in here, but you don't see 192.168.12.11, which is PCB. Okay, so it's not in here at all. So if I do a ping to 192.168.12.11, okay, it's probably going to time out for a little bit and then start working. Unreachable, that should work. Okay. I'll go back over here and see. Okay. All righty. Well, let's do this. Why is there a password on this thing? On pod 10? Uh, go to the content and look at what the, what the labs is. Because it will automatically add stuff at a different time. No, you're supposed to set it. You're supposed to set it, but it's not. No, it's not a right. Our switch is there, it goes. Doesn't show like a show VLAN. Everybody's in the default VLAN, so that's work. I'm not in there. Show VLAN. Everybody's in the default VLAN there. Okay, let me do something here real quick, folks. Config T yet. VLAN 1, IP at 192.168.12.2.255. I'm putting IP address here on the switch virtual interface for the switch. No shit. Now let's go to PC2. Yeah, VLAN 1, IP at 192.168.12.2.255. Dot one eight dot twelve dot three two five five dot two five five dot two five five dot zero no shut so three ping access going to change that ping one nine two dot one one six eight dot twelve dot twelve Okay, so that's working. So that should ping. Should better ping through then. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so that's weird. Let's do it this way then. We can one one ways. Skin a cat. Is the firewalls blocking it? Uh, you know, that's a good question. Could be. It should be turned off, but. Uh, 
<laughs> no, we got them turned off. Yeah, it's trying. Did you I, I peek and fig all to check to make sure that address took? Yeah, that's a good idea too. Nope, did not. I'd be darned. That's weird. Do it with the NCPA CPL, I think. Did you? Oh, that ain't what I want. Okay. Either one will work, but N uh, A C P L. No, N C P A C P L. N C P A dot C P L. Yeah, I know. Oh, I can't type. N C P A dot C P L. Yeah, there you go. That was where I was. Y'all saw me put the IP address on, right? Yeah, there it is. I didn't know. It didn't apply, though. Yeah. I this uh, and you know how to fix it? It's, uh, here's what you had to do. N A N A C N N C P A, like the guy who. N C P A. I got you. N C P A. Dot C P L. Let me stop Wireshark. Wireshark may have caused the issue. Now let's see what we got. What in the world? Make sure it took over here. It took there. And this is why you use real equipment because real equipment doesn't work like packet tracing. Sometimes Windows just doesn't want to do what you want to do. There it goes, finally. All right. Now, let's start actually capturing. 25 minutes later. All right, so I'm going to go over here to PC. I'm going to do ARP A. And you should see I don't have, well, I do have 1211 because it must have learned it automatically. But let's, let's go ahead and pin it here. Uh, D. Well done. Oh, I got to be. Can't delete things out of the ARP cache without admin privileges. So I'm going to do ARP SD. And you'll see I no longer have 12.11 in here. So now I'm going to ping 192.168.12.11. And you'll see it works. You'll also see that I now have in my ARP cache an entry for 12.11. You'll also be able to go over here and stop my capture. And we should be able to do an ARP, ARP not RO. And we should be able to see our ARP request here. And you'll see who has from my machine sent a broadcast from the source, which is my MAC address. Okay, so if I go back over here and look at PCA and do an IP config, that's all. You'll see that my MAC address is uh, 95 97 so you'll see here that 95 97 sent a request broadcast, which was an ARP request, 080806. And it was a request. And it says, who has this IP address? 
And what is your MAC address? And look what happened. There's the ARP response. It says 192.168.12.11 is a 95A362. And I put that into my MAC address table on the PCA side. So I think I found my three years or so. I'm on. Until we get get back, I might need to unpin that too. Okay, there we go. If you have a question, just just unmute Karen. But but there's something way yours is set up. It's causing a, an echo in the in the recording. But you'll see this is a local ARP request and an ARP reply. So we're on a local network. There's no there's no router in here. If PCB was on a, another network, the router would have had to have responded because you'll notice again, this is a broadcast. It's broadcast to all Fs, the ARP request is. It's got, it goes out to all Fs, which is the broadcast MAC address. Let's see questions here. Okay. Oh, did I do 1210 and B? All right, that's what it was. And Bob, I put the same IP address on both. That was my screw up then. Oh, be careful. Charles, I hope uh, thunderstorm's okay. But yeah, I did. That's what I did then. I made a, made a fat finger. But this is how local PCs handle ARP tables. Well, guess what? Switches have ARP tables. Figure out the correct way to do this one. Everyone's different. Here's the show MAC address table, and you'll see how it has learned the MAC addresses of the PCs on the ports connected to it. So on port FA06, you'll see the switch one knows that the MAC address is 95AD97, which is my MAC address. You'll see my MAC address up here. Oh, fan prompt. Okay. here so you can see that my mac address is 95897 and switch one knows about it right there so we're going to talk a lot more about how switches do this in chapter seven as we move along but basically what a switch does is a switch figures out all the mac addresses of the devices connected to it and then uses that to do filtering. But it does it by looking at those ARP requests and the frames that come in and determines what's on each one of its ports. I have a quick question. Dude. So I know the man in the middle attack, this is a problem that they go in and they, they swap out MAC addresses here. Yep. So how do you protect, other than a password, the um, MAC address table? All right. There's a thing called switch port port security. So what we're going to do is we're going to go into FA06, which is right here, and we're going to do switch port port security. And uh, OK, first off, I got to do switch port uh, mode access, which makes it a, an access port. And then I'm going to do switch port, port security, turn on port security. Then I'm going to say switch port, port security, uh, access to switch port, port security, Mac. Okay. Now, here's what I could do. I could actually go in and find my MAC address. So my MAC address is uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0005. So that right there, 0, 0, 0, 0005. And so what I would do is I would put in that MAC address right there. And then what would happen is if I did that, I'm not gonna do it right now because uh, it can actually cause some issues. But if I did it, what I could end up doing is if anybody connected any machine other than the um, machine that I put the MAC address in for, 
it would shut that port down automatically. So that's one way we can do it. We can do what's called switch port port security because then what happens is if someone tries to masquerade as the router port's IP address, I mean MAC address, the port that it tries to come in on, that device will be shut down because it'll be like, no, sorry, that MAC address is not allowed on that port. So that is one way we can do it. There are other ways too. One, another way is to physically control access to our switch ports. Um, the one problem you have is if you do set your maximum number of MAC addresses on a port to one, you have to be very careful because just think about all the virtualization we do today to where we put a hypervisor on a local machine. If you do that in a classroom, then the only MAC address that would be allowed would be the physical address that is connected to that device. Whereas anything that's inside your hypervisor would not have the ability to get out. So you have to be a little bit careful with that. Right. Okay. Thank you. But that's, and I, and I tell you what, you will learn how to do that in CCNA 3 if you take that class. This is actually taught in CCNA. In fact, it's on the contest we have right here today. I made them do switchboard port security. I made them do some other things. So. But that's a very good question. That's how you can that's how you can uh, protect your router or your switch ports. Now, I'm going to stop here because we're at an hour, but I want you to make sure you've read through module seven. Um, as we're moving forward, make sure you pay attention to how switches learn their the MAC addresses on their ports and how they use that to filter information. What's going to actually happen is the, the switches will learn all the MAC addresses on the ports. And then using that, if A is sending to C, A can just, when it comes in on port one, the MAC address table is, if it's filled out on the switch, it'll just automatically know to send that out port three, instead of having to send it out two, three, and four and find out where it's at. And so we end up with the ability of A to send to C while B is sending to D and vice versa. Okay. Real quick, you don't have any pre-recorded lessons for eight and nine? Uh, don't think I've got those done yet. Um, okay, I you know, couldn't find. Them. Yeah, I don't think we've we've got those done yet. Um, yeah, I think we're still working on those. Okay, no problem. I just was looking for them. Thank you. I think we're up to seven right now. Is where we got. No, I got I got eight. I got module eight. I don't have module nine. So module eight lecture is right here. Uh, I don't have module nine yet. So some of the module nine stuff is actually these uh, old lecture on networking addressing and holy steps subnetting that helps with that. But module eight is here and module seven is here. So if you want to watch the lecture on module seven, you can do so. Okay. Yep, David, we'll get to grading. We got a lot of grading to do. We know um, being at live yesterday, last week, and being uh, here this week, we we know we're behind grading. We actually just split up the grading and made sure everybody's got to knows what they're doing. So we're getting ready to start doing some grading. Wow, it's still, it's still yep. so. All right. Um, any other questions? No, this is Lorraine, but don't grade my chapter three, module three exam. I got to redo it. Oh, exams are all, um, again, those aren't graded by us. They're graded automatically, and you can take each exam up to 10 times. So we're, uh, we're not worried about that at all. So, okay, everyone, I'm going to stop my recording.